Hi class, instead of me lecturing on this in class today, I decided to go ahead and do this in video since I'm not there. I have also shared these slides with you on Google Classroom. It is a Prezi. Um, what you need to do during the video is you need to take out pen and paper or your computer and you need to take notes on what I am saying and telling you. And these notes are due by the end of class, either to Google Classroom or to the baskets. I loaded this the Prezi for you on Google Classroom, just in case I go a little too fast for you on the first couple slides with writing information down. Okay, the first thing is we're reading the Canterbury Tales. This was written by an author named Geoffrey Chaucer. He was born in thir what they think is 1343. They think that because back then, obviously, they didn't have birth certificates. So when they actually put the tombstones down for people who had died, they put what they thought was the year and usually what they did is they put it into the middle year because they weren't sure if it was really 1342 43 or 44 so they put it in 43 with a question mark to kind of fill in that gap and he did die in 1400 now Geoffrey Chaucer takes his experiences during the medieval ages and the medieval world to help him prepare to write the Canterbury Tales now, the Canterbury Tales is a complete picture of life in the 14th century or the 1300s. He, what he does is he gathers 29 pilgrims together in his story from different walks of life. And by gathering those characters together, he's giving us that complete picture because we're seeing people from high, middle, and low class. So it kind of, And we're seeing people from the religious um, and from the monarchy as well. Stories were composed later years of his life, so this actually took started being written in 1390, and he wrote it until his death in 1400. He went on this pilgrimage to Canterbury to see Becket Shrine, St. Thomas Becket. Um, I would make sure you get that name, St. Thomas Becket, was the Bishop of Canterbury in 1170. And so that he was the Bishop of Canterbury 20 or sorry, 200 years before this takes place. And he, Canterbury is the main religious center, kind of like the Vatican and Jerusalem in other religions. Canterbury is the main religious center in England. During this time, England was very Catholic, but they had their main religious center there because it was closer in England instead of having to travel to the Vatican for everything. And they had a Bishop that lived there and saint thomas becket was that bishop now he was murdered in 1170 for not really doing anything wrong he had a fight with the king of england and in that fight they had a disagreement and kind of a falling out the king went back and mentioned this to his knights and his knights unbeknownst to him decided that they would go and kill saint thomas becket now, when they murdered him, the knights were actually punished by the king and put into exile. And the king was very upset about this because it wasn't something that he meant to happen. Because of this and because of the idea that St. Thomas Becket was made a martyr and murdered for something that really didn't need to happen, the Catholic Church decided to make him a saint. So now in Canterbury people flocked there to pay their respects and show their holy devotion. Canterbury is about a six day walk or 60 mile walk out of London and it's south of London. And I'm going to show you some pictures and stuff throughout the couple weeks that we're doing this. But this is the big pilgrimage that people take in London and it's mainly on horse or on foot. And because it's the 1300s when the story takes place, it's a very slow journey. It takes about three to four days to get there and about three to four days to get back. Now, his window, Geoffrey Chaucer's window, even though he went on the journey once to Canterbury to pay his respects, his where he lives, his window actually overlooks the path of the pilgrimage. So every year in the spring, around Easter time, when people start to take this pilgrimage, he watches them and he takes notes because he takes the information from real life and real stories and makes it into his. So the story seems kind of nonfiction, 
but it has some fictional aspects. The part we're going to read is more of the non-fiction aspect because it's more of the characterization. So Geoffrey Chaucer is first of all considered the father of English poetry. You will notice when we are reading the text that it is all in rhymed couplets. Rhymed couplets meaning every two lines rhyme. That is our first type of poetry that we're going to read and this leads into our big poetry unit which we will get into right after the Canterbury Tales. So because of that he is considered the father of English poetry. Because of his achievements, he is buried in Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is a huge church in England. You've probably seen it on TV, especially with relation to, like, if you watched um, Kate and William's wedding, it was actually there. His area where he's buried at is a tomb best known as Poet's Corner. He is the first one to be named there and other famous poets started to be buried there afterwards. Now, Westminster Abbey, not anyone can just be buried there. You have to be a famous person who did something vital for England, and then when you die, the monarchy invites you to be buried there. So Geoffrey Chaucer, with what he had accomplished and what he had done, invited, his family was invited to have him buried there and his family definitely took them up on the offer and he was the first one there and it became known as Poets Corner. Now this is a picture of Westminster Abbey. The church is actually, if you look from the top, it's in a T uh, or a cross shape and um, the church does this for a reason because of the idea of that holy religious devotion. So this is the front entrance off of the bottom of the cross into Westminster Abbey. This is the tomb of Poets Corner. Um, you could actually, this is, this is the oldest one and this is Geoffrey Chaucer's tomb itself. His body is actually contained in this and then the rest of the shrine is built up around it with some words of devotion to him and then other famous poets as they died in England were buried here. Now story backgrounds. Each character, and like I said there are 29 characters, tells a story about their pilgrimage to Canterbury. Now the prologue though is an introduction to each character and we're only reading the prologue. We are not reading the 29 tales that go with the prologue. We're only reading the prologue because of the idea of this sense of characterization and the idea of the historical context behind it so that we can see that. Now a pilgrimage is a long annual trip to holy places and it's popular ways to express religious devotion. Each religion seems to have their place that you go. If you're Catholic you go to the Vatican, if you're Jewish you go to Jerusalem, if you're Muslim um, you usually go to Mecca. So there are different places in England, like I had said, because of the time period they went to Canterbury and because Canterbury was difficult for them to get to because of the fact that they had to walk or travel by horse. It gives us that sense of it was that pilgrimage. People went there to pray. They went there to honor St. Thomas Becket. They went there to pay their respects. They went to ask for help during sickness, times of sickness for family and friends but it definitely gives us this varied aspect of what pilgrim life was like in the 14th century. So the pilgrim's occupations reflect different aspects. That's why we're going to get 29 different pilgrims in here. Now we're going to get them to fall into three different categories. When we are reading each one, I will explain what the actual occupation is. So for now, I just suggest that you write down the name of the category and you write down the names of the pilgrims. Pilgrims did not have names in, in his story. Very few were actually named. He named them more by occupation because he wanted them to display that sense of the stereotype that all knights were this way or all squires were this way. So the first one we have is the feudal system. Feudal meaning high-ranking land owners down to their peasants that worked for them on their farms. Now we have Knight, Squire, Yeoman, Franklin, Plowman, Miller, and Reeve. These are the order basically of how they fall within the feudal system. 
knight being the highest ranking because they oversee the area of land. The squire works, the squire and the yeoman work for the knights. And then the Franklin, Plowman, Miller, and Reeve work on the actual lands themselves. The next we have is religious life characters. These are not in any particular ranking order, um, but Chaucer very much was a devout Catholic, but he was very upset with, with what was going on during this time of the Catholic Church. So when we are looking at the varied aspects of these types of characters, we are going to look at the corruption within the church at the time period as well. Here we have the nun, the monk, the friar, the cleric, the parson, the summoner, and the partner. Again, na no, no names, just occupations. And the final one we have are the trades and professions. These are the people that live in town. In the city of London, they own their shops. They have a trade of some kind. They usually have some education or training to go with it. We have a merchant, sergeant at the law, sergeant of the law as our lawyer. We have the five tradesmen, a cook, a skipper, which is your boat captain, a doctor, a wife of Bath, she is your professional wife, your manciple, which is like your police officer, and your host, which is our, which is Geoffrey Chaucer himself, who is hosting this journey. Now we're going to look at um, three types of literary devices. The first two we're going to look at fall into the characterization category. We're specifically going to look at direct and indirect characterization. Now, characterization is the technique of revealing the character. Does the author do it directly or they do it indirectly? Directly means they present direct statements about the characters. They see, say things like they have blue eyes. So you automatically know directly from their mouth that that character was built with blue eyes. Now, indirect characterization is you have to use the critical thinking side of your brain because you have to look at the actions, the thoughts, the dialogue, and the descriptions that the author uses to reveal a character's personality. So if we look at the statement, they helped to win the game. This statement, yes, tells you directly that they helped to win the game, but indirectly, it tells you that this person is a good player, that this person is a team player, that they play well, and it tells you all of those aspects within the game itself. So it's indirectly telling us more information about that person. The last one we're going to look at is this idea of social commentary. Like I had already said, Chaucer was a huge writer of this time period, but he was also a huge Catholic and he was very much upset with the Catholic Church and the idea of indulgences specifically, and we will talk about that more in class tomorrow. Now, because of this, he, this story is very much a social commentary on what is taking place. It very much fits the stereotypes, and it very much fits into that idea of that characterization. So his writing offers insight into society, its values, its customs. He looks closely at the life of the 1300s, and when we're reading this story, we will see how he feels about that life because he is very open to it. Okay? Make sure you finish your notes. If you need to look at the Prezi, you can. And make sure the notes are either turned into Google Classroom if you typed it. And if not, they need to be turned in handwritten to the appropriate basket. I will be back tomorrow. I will post homework on Google Classroom for you. Once you finish this, then work on something for another class and continue on the quest if you haven't already done so. Thank you and have a good day.